Good morning, Dr. Susan Pommers. We are very happy you are here. You are the guest, our guest today. And um, you are so generous to have discussion between you and me in order to help the students to generate their own interests, their own questions, their own answers. So uh, I'm very happy you're here. You just finished a PhD thesis on internationalization for higher education. Great work. And uh, I would like to introduce very shortly what's the topic about. The topic is about open educational resources. Well, Susan, what's your feeling about that term? <laughs> So you may already have wondered the name commerce, is that a coincidence? It's not. This is my dad, I'm visiting for the weekend and I was asked to be part of this course and I'm very honored of course. Um, my PhD research has mainly focused on higher education and the recent developments within that field. And I think this is an incredibly important topic to discuss, especially in the time of Corona, in the time of new technologies. Um, so, very honored and very nice also to meet you and to be part of this uh, course because I think, yeah, like I said, it's an important topic to, to uh, discuss. And your first question was? Well, uh, the term open educational resources. What's the association? What does it give to you? Mm. So it's open. <laughs> what is, what uh, does it mean for you? Open? open to me has a sense of accessibility. Uh, it means access accessible. That's what comes to my mind Excellent. first. Yes. Um, and educational researchers indicates that it has some value for people's learning and their development. Uh, and of course, this seems like a very broad term, so I'm very curious to Absolutely. learn more. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I have a list here on, uh, on slide number six. It mentions a number of formats that can be part of open educational resources. So, should I list them very quickly? Mm -hmm. Full courses, uh, course materials, so ingredients of courses, modules, textbooks, streaming videos, tests, software and any other tool, materials or techniques used to support access to knowledge. Does it make sense? Do we need it in education nowadays? So, I wonder what makes this an open educational resource then, because to me this also could be just resources for education. Exactly. Except that if a textbook is open, it's free. Uh -huh. You can just download it and you can modify it mm. to your need. Is it valuable? I mean, is the educational field waiting for it? Does it make a difference? What do you think? Mm. Maybe it's a bit early to talk about, but later we will cover it. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, we have... Um, I already give a list on uh, slide 7. OERs, why are they so important? So, I give just a list. And uh, it's economy, it's logistics, production, didactic, adapt and differentiate, exploit towards blended learning, policy, corona-proof. Mm. Well, that's, that's a whole topic, isn't that? Who can escape from that? So what will students learn from this course? Good question. Uh, it was my assignment, given by Dr. Peppino Franco. He said, uh, dear Dr. Commerce, would you like to give a course on open education resources? So I was looking, what are the main ingredients, what's the history, and what's the predictive future? And to answer that question, this is a good question, I went back to what are ongoing educational paradigms, innovative paradigms like discovery learning, like active learning, like constructivism, like uh, job-based learning. And I thought, in this context, mm. what can these open resources offer there? Does it sound satisfactory or do you see another perspective to include? I think that uh, it's, those are relevant questions to ask. I wonder what will students take away from this course? What, will be, what will they be able to do with it? Let me give you my expectation. My expectation is that students, they are from many contexts, mostly they are interested in lifelong learning. So they might be teachers or become teachers or course leaders, curriculum developers, uh, vocational learning managers. 
So they have very different uh, goals in the future. My expectation is that nowadays it's rather unexplored area, the open educational resources, and it will help them to make wise decisions in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, uh, further career development, etc. So it's, it's an open asset to motivate them to look over the landscape and say, ah, oh, wait a minute, maybe I can use it. Mm. That's the prospect. Okay, yes. well, I, th I hope that sounds uh, useful to you. Good day. My name is Piet Kommers. I am professor of educational technology at the University of Twente and also for UNESCO. Learning technologies is my core business in the sense of teaching and research. Uh, for you in this course I would like to open the arena and to think with you what are open educational resources. You might think maybe it has to do with just learning material but it's broader than that and in order to benefit from its potential in this new era especially when the coronavirus has still the power I would like to discuss what are educational contexts what are innovations going on that also decide what is the value the potential value of educational resources open educational resources resources means something you can use so for learning purposes it can be text pictures video clips audio collections but also practical units like exercises simulations virtual reality components games those are resources that can be used in this case especially to learn and to help in the teaching process already UNESCO in 2002 has coined the term open educational resources it includes teaching learning and research materials so scientific publications we call it mostly open access these are all ingredients to make future learning quicker more flexible and more effective we already mentioned the term open resources what do we mean by that first of all the most common one is that some piece of information resides in the public domain it means that it's open for any person to access it to reuse it and to modify it it means that there are no costs involved however the cost should also be taken into account as the time needed by the teacher curriculum developer to access to filter and to process the information to link it to embed it into a certain course that's also a cost factor we will meet it later Open licensing is built within the existing framework of intellectual property rights as defined by relevant international conventions and respects the authorship of the work. In order to be a little bit more precise, uh, on the left side in this uh, uh, diagram you see all rights reserved, copyright, that's the traditional way. If you write a book, uh, Without publishing, you have the rights to exploit it. You have the copyrights. If you sell it to the publisher, the copyright is forwarded to the publisher. He or she may take advantage, financial benefits, sell it only 
the publisher should ask the author if the publisher wants to change it or to to make an update then the author is again in charge it's called the droit royal it's the it's the royal convention of the moral right we have at the left side so the traditional one is you can say this is my work i do not allow you to take to take it and to repurpose it you need to ask for my permission to use this at the right side the open license is saying it's mine but i do allow you to take my material just remember to make a proper attribution to me it's free and you do not need to ask for my permission to use it so this is a huge difference take care that you have to make a reference to the original maker that is still what we call the courtesy role let's go now to the uh, more concrete formats of open resources uh, first of all what you might not have thought so far is that there are many open full courses we call it MOOCs massive open online courses and of course if you find such a molecular big chunk of courseware and it fits exactly to your learning needs then you can just take it or make links to that that's the easy one second option is that you find course materials of all types of modalities it can be video clips it can be simulation programs also these components can be very valuable as a bootstrapping mechanism for you in order to make your own course modules chunks of courses that have a certain topic a certain focus we have of course textbook in electronic textbooks that are free to insert in your courses we have streaming videos we have even tests assessment modules where you can pre-test your prior knowledge we call it also format evaluation uh, informal testing it's formative evaluation and then we have software to do the physical thing like loading the information structuring we will later we will see the the concept mapping approach in order to keep uh, control over large chunks of information and the navigation in it and then finally we have any other tools materials and techniques to support access to knowledge for instance databases uh, data mining mechanisms for deep learning and uh, also machine learning we will come back to that later the main goal for this lecture is to answer the question why are open educational resources so important uh, and that's your agenda to, uh, to to make notes and to articulate for yourself what are the proper answers to the to the following six criteria first criterion to use OER or not is the economy does it give a positive balance between the costs of getting into a lot of information the risk of losing your interest or the digression versus what does it help you does it save time to produce to get the right quality of information what is the what is the final positive benefit second is logistics uh, should be flexible in terms that what you make uh, should be free of any uh, any uh, loads any uh, financial consequences uh, and it should keep you flexible in terms of the goal <coughs> of the course the third is the production fit for purpose is it specific enough can you focus on the learning goal for yourself or of your students four is the didactic criterion 
Does it allow you to adapt closer to the learning styles of your students, to the actual prior knowledge, to their interest, to their developmental stage, to their momentary interest? We call it differentiate, to tune and to, uh, to be very specific. The fifth one is the exploitation. Uh, if you use blended learning, is it, is it uh, manageable? Uh, in the time of Corona, we see of course that some schools keep closed, even universities, they will totally switch to uh, web-based learning. <clears throat> and the question is, uh, is it necessary for you to go blended? And uh, what does it bring you in terms of uh, administration and the whole complexity of uh, making it available to students abroad, for instance. The policy question is uh, corona-proof, that's an exemplar of policy, but there might be more policies. Some universities, they still refrain from having web-based material because they say, well, we want to see our students on the campus, that's our business model, so the policy um, exploration is important for you. You have to take these dimensions, the sixth one, all in mind in order to make a proper decision, finally. Open educational resources, we are... The full spectrum of utilities with uh, open educational information is, uh, is fivefold. It's the five R's of open education. The first is retain. You can keep the work forever. Second is the reuse. You can use the work for your own purpose. Three, to revise. You can adapt modify or translate the work. Four, remix. You can combine it with another resource to make a new work. Finally, five, distribute, redistribute. You can share the work with others. A plethora of possibilities that are hard to achieve in the traditional way of authoring and publishing. The quality of open educational resources is not only the quality of the material in itself. Uh, there are many factors that decide about can it be found back by other users, so the findability. Is it clearly described, we call it the metadata, attributes that can be used as links to, to find it back, keywords. Uh, it should be clearly licensed, 
should express if it's uh, uh, open comments. Is it trusted? Do you have some reference from people who uh, said it's a good quality? Is it easy to modify? Is it autonomous? Can it be freestanding? Is it free of copyrights? Is it recommended? Etc. All these factors decide about usability of open educational resources. It's always good that in the beginning, when you get excited and frantic about a new technical feature, to ask yourself, is it really new? Will it make a difference? And so here we have the question, is information access at a large scale as we do now, is it still a game changer? Or is it just a magnification? Is it just a kind of extrapolation of what we did before in the copy machine, in the blueprint, in the camera, in the uh, photo camera, etc. Is it really new or is it just the scale of what we did before? You see here Plato carrying a laptop. Can you imagine what it would have meant for the ID development of Plato? Would he have been happy using it? Uh, would he have felt comfortable to generate ideas about the, uh, the universe, about the pure ideas? Uh, does the medium make a difference? One of the famous slogans is, the medium makes the message, the medium is the message, which says that in fact the media always have some effect, some deep consequences. That's why I would like you to be very critical on this stand, do open resources, do they make a difference? Is it really something new at a large scale? Will it have an impact? Well, in order to help you a little bit uh, to provide answers to my previous questions, I think it's good to realize that as more and more books were produced in the last two centuries, uh, the reputation of the book became more problematic. You can uh, imagine if you have only one or two books in your house, they will be seen as the Bibles, the, the real books, the real knowledge, the real reputation. But as you get more and more books in your home, they are given away nowadays. People have a kind of window shop in front of their house and you can just take the book. They say, please take a book, only don't bring it back. You see, that's a totally different uh, metaphor for the wisdom of the books as we had before. <clears throat> it's a nice example. I don't uh, mention the country, but in one of the countries there was a problematic stage where the school books were, after a conflict with the publisher and the transporter, the books were thrown into the, into the valley. They were destroyed right before the, the school year would start. <coughs> and the effect was opposite. You might have thought that it became very problematic. It did become problematic in the beginning, but teachers started to teach by heart, as I would say. They had to recollect what's the essence of my course. And by doing so, the courses became better. They became more genuine. The teacher became, let's say, a true expert to play the solo of his rhetoric, the narrative, the story became more uh, audible than before. So we can say if more and more of a certain modality like open access courses are become available, it becomes also problematic if the same standard is kept. Well, we have already addressed the question, do OERs make it more affordable to build education, to follow education? And this figure illustrates that 
the price of textbooks have gone up. Apart from the reputation that is a matter of inflation, but we see also that uh, you can do less and less with the money. That's called the inflation at 17%. But apart from that, apart from the fact that money gets less and less value, we call it inflation, the textbooks become more expensive anyway. And you can say, well, that's the dispute about uh, publishers. Do they get too big, too big margins, too big profits? And it's the input for the question, do we need open resources? And the answer, of course, is yes, because we see that inflation plus the higher price for books together, 41%, is a good reason to do something to help students from parents that have not uh, too much money. So we need to help them from a democratic point of view, from an emancipatory point of view, from a human point of view, from a culture, from a technology point of view. Society needs access more and better than we had before. How do we do it? By allowing teachers to build their own learning material. As a summary to the question, why are open educational resources so important? First of all, I think in the most global terms, it's an economical asset, it's a benefit to make economies dynamic, uh, future-oriented and cost-effective. Second is logistics, flexibility of the distribution and redistribution and to give a second and a third and a fourth life to existing lesson materials. The third is uh, the production. Does it fit particular educational needs? Does it fit in a certain didactic situation? That means the teacher should decide how to use it, when to use it, and for what, teach for what students. Four is the didactic adaptation and differentiation. Is it flexible enough for the teachers to adapt it, to modify it? Five is the exploitation. It uh, should be, let's say, bootstrapping towards blended learning. And six is, six is the policy, corona proof, for instance. That's a typical example of policy demand at that very moment. There are several types of open educational resources. The main groups are those meant for teaching, those meant for learning, and of course the research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. OERs have been defined in various ways, but the key concept is that they can be adapted by others. So the big difference with traditional open courseware is that they were allowed to be reused, but the open educational resources nowadays, they allow to be taken by anybody and it will be tuned to a new special target group. So we have open access, which is a huge effect for uh, scientific publications. Most of the publishers already agree that their business model will be changed. In the past you would earn some money, some royalties for having written articles, but nowadays you have to pay before it can be published and then it's free for anybody on the world to open it. Uh, further on in this segment we will talk about the types of open educational resources, the whole list, images, video, video lectures, homework, exercise, e-books, open textbook chapters, infographics, whole courses, audio podcasts, interactive games, tests and quizzes, elements of existing courses, slides and class presentations. 
one of the special um, possibilities of educational resources is that it allows users to build upon each other. Uh, this is called adaptation. But maybe it goes beyond adaptation. It is a kind of co-creation between the various generations of teachers who respect each other and say this is a nice piece of didactic material, I want to use it and give it the flavor so that it fits seamlessly in my lessons. So that is a particular thing and uh, the current tools that we have to edit video and audio and text of course, uh, that allows teachers to do so. Uh, it is the mentality that teachers are not just a uh, king in their estate, but they are collaborative colleagues and they make each other achievement even better. In order to clarify the typical difference between open access and open educational resources, it is good to refer back to the Berlin Declaration that says literally our mission of disseminating knowledge is only half complete if the information is not made widely and readily available to society. That shows a new implicit mission, a new uh, ideology for those who create educational resources. If you look to the distribution of different types of media ingredients, information formats for open educational resources, we see that images and video have the highest score, probably because they have a rather high intensity and cost for production. And strange enough, the whole course, we can see it at a level of 40%, so it's a bit about in the middle of the whole spectrum. It means that uh, only a rather few uh, elements of the teachers, they use the whole courses. Now, uh, using whole courses has got a new name since about eight years. Um, if you pick and mix courses and uh, just give it to your students or students, they pick it themselves. It's called MOOC. A MOOC is a massive open online course. And the idea is that the, the top universities of the world, um, Harvard for instance, they have opened their archives and said, why don't we show the quality of our teaching to the whole world? So it was not really an altruistic motive. The motivation was to say, well, we want to show off. We want, we are so sure that we have a high quality. We want to show it so that uh, students will come to us. Um, the effect has been, uh, however, that the level of looking critically, uh, the quality awareness at uh, almost every university has increased a lot since the publication of MOOCs. Uh, we will talk a bit later on the nature of MOOCs. Don't forget the name, Massive Open Online Courses. If we talk about new tendencies in education, where open and educational resources are taking a role, we can see three main factors that drive the innovation of education. The most versatile is the technology that penetrates in education. We have seen that the mobile devices, but now also the virtual reality, the gaming, the simulations, they have a huge impact in the didactics and in the style of learning. Learning becomes much more exploratory, discovery, rather than just receiving the information. So technology is a very, very versatile factor. Hard to predict because it's not education, 
that uh, develops or invents technology, it's the whole society, the whole business of media that is dictating. The second one, the second factor that decides upon uh, educational trends is the culture. School cultures are evolving all the time. We've seen in the 60s and the 70s a huge transformation from the student as, a, as an obedient uh, passenger in education who just need to absorb the knowledge and the skills until in the 80s, 70s and 80s the student became more, let's say, a personality, a person who has his own agenda, who has his own view, early view on life, what is important. And the culture is a little bit swinging between the recipient until to the constructivistic approach. The most stable factor is the nature of learning. That is, in fact, how the brain works, how the human body works, how we use sleep in slow wave sleep to digest the experiences of the prior of the previous day. So uh, nature, we learn more and more how the mind, how the brains work, uh, until food technology, until sleep technology. We know more and more factors to benefit from nature, but it's not so much uh, a quickly changing field. I mean, we we are obeying nature still in the in the twenties. So we have the three factors: the technology, the culture, and the nature. Those are the three factors that drive the evolution of learning and, of course, the evolution of education. One of the most obvious transformations nowadays in education is the awareness that knowledge is not only in the person, but is to a large extent between persons as well. This means that optimal achievements like problem solving, designing big projects like designing urban planning or technical device is a matter of combining people from several disciplines and let them work complementary together. What does it mean for education? We know in education and we see that collaborative learning has a big priority. Uh, students working together in projects they communicate about their learning process and what we see is that it's beneficial, not always, but many times it's beneficial, especially for the students who can teach to weaker students in the lower grades. We see that for the weaker students who can explain to someone who is not yet ready in the curriculum, those situations have a big advantage. It means that from very early on, students become aware that they need to manifest what they know and what they learn in a group process, in a communicative, in a collaborative process. This has uh, many advantages for the working area where they they don't look for solo players, they look for team players. And it also means that um, our assessment system should take some notice of the fact that the real knowledge is a group process. So far we don't see that. We see still assessments is an individual process, individual grades, pass or fail, that's a matter for the individual student. And uh, in that sense, we can say that it's a disparity, it's a kind of conflict between the new learning paradigm, collectivistic learning, and the assessment practices that we see in schools and higher education. A good example of cooperative learning, or sometimes we say collaborative learning, is what you see in this slide. Um, 
initially there was a lack of tablets in the schools and um, as many disadvantages scarcity can turn out to be even better for pedagogical or didactic reasons what's the case uh, students they look to each other behavior they learn how the co-student learn and uh, that means that there is more than sharing the devices it's not only that it is also a more mutual process where students learn from each other how to learn and this is a good example and nowadays we see that um, in many countries uh, each of the students has a tablet for him or herself we can see in collaborative learning that there is some counterintuitive aspect phenomenon namely that uh, what we typically tend to think is that the weaker students learn from the brighter students and that's only part of the picture uh, the most interesting process I think is when we see that a student who is weak or moderate in his own class uh, can go and help in one or two grades class lower and help students at their level with more simple subject matter and what we see then that these students uh, they develop a more conscious style of learning they become let's say aware uh, what the evocation means what talking about what you think means what it does to your own thinking and of course they also have a different role they have a more prominent role a more guiding role a tutor role and this uh, proves to be quite satisfactory quite beneficial for students who in their own class have a weak or moderate position here we see two students uh, struggling to work together on one tablet um, one might say well it's a waste of time or maybe it's a torture but in fact if you look very carefully um, students are quite different um, in their skills to to operate such devices for instance to know how to make the tablet uh, resistant for turning the landscape to the portrait mode etc so what we see is that uh, the complementarity in this, this, these uh, practical skills um, that is that is a big blessing that's uh, that's in fact is um, what we call it is um, some extra uh, some, uh, some some extra gift after the lack of devices so uh, don't say too quickly ah we need uh, twice the number of uh, tablets uh, first see how they can work together and uh, be sensitive for the uh, mutual um, synergy in their learning style talking about open educational resources we can see at the level of secondary school that there is a kind of interesting gap between what the learning in terms of cognitive development in terms of personal learning style in terms of strengths and weakness in short short term memory capacity uh, those are complicating things uh, that allow for more and more um, differentiation however as the secondary school is finishing we know that there is the central examination uh, national one and it means that there is there is a very strict summative evaluation of skills and knowledge and that is the real challenge for open educational resources to mitigate the gap between the personal and the uh, let's say the objective the the hard line of measurement where teachers need to be helped and i hope 
it can become clear in the rest of this course. In order to integrate open-end educational resources in real educational settings, it's important to see which are the main trends of innovation. Uh, in this schedule you can see five of them. The most important is active learning. It means that students are encouraged to uh, undertake um, their own learning activities, to make decisions, to do their own planning, even in, uh, in an extreme format, it's called problem-based learning, students are choosing their own learning goals and to choose the projects. So active learning is a wide spectrum of um, more um, intense learning approaches. The second recent trend since about 20 years is constructivism. It means that Students are encouraged to build up their knowledge in an active way by making many connections to their prior knowledge. So concepts are seen as mental objects that need to be integrated in a larger structure of knowledge. And the constructivistic approach has been uh, claimed by Simon Peppert, the inventor of the Logo programming system. The idea was that students, before learning to program, they had to play with the primitives in the Logo language. This construction became a mental set uh, for learning any new topics. It was generalized to learning new knowledge at large. The third new paradigm for learning is cooperative learning, also called collaborative. Collaborative means working together and cooperative means there is a collective goal, there is a joint goal, so you work together in an altruistic way. Already we uh, talked a little bit about cooperative learning and its major benefit is that students become more aware of how they learn, how they think, because they have to express it all the time to their co-students. So the metacognitive effect is much larger than sitting and working in your own book only. Cooperative learning has been raised in the late 60s to make uh, learning more vivid, more social, and it is uh, uh, inspired by Lev Vygotsky. The fourth new element in learning is authentic learning. It means it respects the more real situation that students are in, not only in the school, in their homes, in their hobbies, in their neighborhood. So it's the more complex, complex, contextualized world where students learn the world. And the theory is that Authentic means taking notice of the real awareness that students develop on the world. It means also that um, students have a larger stake in how they approach a new subject. Finally, intentional learning means that the teacher needs to make an overall framework so that the learning is focused on relevant topics. It can be the neighborhood, it can be a recent actual event in the local or in the national politics. Uh, it means that the learning is not seen as an island of learning things by the mind, but to make it um, useful for real life. And that means it's a creative job for the teacher to do the mapping between the real life and the topics in the books and the curricula. We just saw that a number of innovative uh, movements have come into education. This has consequences for open resources. Um, what is the major concern for teachers 
uh, also for communication advisors, is that users who have access to a lot of data are just using it, not contributing. This using, just uh, listen and see, uh, we call it lurking. They just take it and have no added value. So this is the major concern for open educational resources and that's why these new educational approaches have been invented and will be applied in the coming several decades, I expect. We are going to check which new teacher competences are needed in case of open educational resources. And of course the first big influence is that teachers need to be in a constant uh, schooling, constant retraining, uh, capacity building. Uh, why? Uh, the most important reason is that they feel a little, a little bit afraid that students may escape via ICT out of the school system. They might go to places on the web which are not advisable for such age group. And uh, teachers need to know what can they do to monitor the student results. We call it learning analytics. Um, how can they make uh, fences, so to say, how can they protect, protect the students in order not to come in their problem. Further on, we can see that teachers have suffered the last 20 years because they had to teach about media which are to a certain extent clear for the students. So they have to teach about the strange world of ICT, which is not their prime field of expertise. And last of all, we see now a revival of uh, teachers telling stories, the narrative capacities, how to make experiences, how to make uh, knowledge more tangible, how to make it more entertaining. Over the last 20 years, the concept of open education resources has evolved from a loosely defined term for freely accessible courseware to being a part of programmatic strategies now included in many governmental and institutional policies for expanding access to education, enhancing quality of learning and opening lifelong learning opportunities for all. This is the formulation by Mrs. Stefania Giannini on behalf of UNESCO. She continues, at every step of the way, UNESCO has been and continues to be committed to its role as a convener of international collaboration for promoting OER. In fact, the term OER was first coined at UNESCO. As already announced, the availability of large resources, large parts of information, has been seen as a welcomed asset, precious resort, in the start of educational transforms 10 years ago. But now, the last five years, it is seen as also a topic for worrying. As we know, students are curious, that's good. We proclaim active learning. And the role of the teacher is now to see and monitor if the students are really going to a relevant part of the World Wide Web. If it's not the case, they have the role to keep students alert on the curricular core. And that's a topic in itself. So teachers, they need the right tools to prevent from too much digression for the students. As you can see here, the situation for many teachers in the last 20 years has been that they have to teach about the media. And the paradox, of course, is that a large part of the students, they know to use the media and they see the teacher struggling with the uh, immense amount of tools, uh, knowledge domains and also the skills to handle that. So teachers, they didn't feel too comfortable in managing all the new skills in ICT area. That is 
a topic that should be should be solved soon. It is not by accident that teachers have revalued the art of storytelling lately. It's because through the internet you know that clicking on pages and uh, pictures in internet is a mechanism called hypertext and hypermedia. It means that if you click somewhere you will be transported to a new piece of information that uh, gives more details on the term you were clicking on. So this is fragmenting the storylines and what teachers do now they retrain their capacity to to be storytelling and that's in fact what students like a lot too because uh, teachers they carry much more than what they actually say they also express their emotions they express their values their morality so a storyline is a very powerful format to convey ideas and to make students motivated to hear it and to absorb it. Should we urge teachers to use open um, educational resources in their teaching? I have a funny story in relation to this. Is that I started my when I started my uh, dissertation, I had the assignment to work with uh, teachers to use three D printers in their classroom, um, and a lot of the teachers didn't like this technology at all. They didn't know what to do with it. It was stressful for them, uh, and it was one big disaster. Because what happens if a teacher is not fully committed to a certain way of teaching? The material that they try to convey is not coming across at all. It just is not reaching the student. The most defining factor um, of how effective the teaching is, is about the teacher. How convinced is the teacher that this is the right way to teach? That's the most, the best predictor of uh, teaching efficiency. Thank you, Susan, for this vivid example. I think it makes us think. Uh, should we anyway enforce teachers to adopt it? And if we do, should they have, will they have enough freedom to bring their story, yeah. to have a narrative approach? That's maybe... Yeah, and it's interesting because of course you don't want to force teachers to use a certain technology. They may be uh, less comfortable and less good in their teaching, but at the, on the other hand, you want to encourage teachers to embrace the possibilities that such new resources bring to their to their classroom. So this is a tricky balance. It is. Um, and you had some experience. So what was the final solution? What did you do to? The final solution is that we offered trainings to teachers where they could learn how to embrace such technology and to apply it in their classroom. And instead of telling them, this is what you should do, we asked them, what would be the possibilities for you in your classroom? To really go from their perspective and their story and their narrative, and then see how the technology could be integrated in their teaching, instead of enforcing it on them. And this is a very important, I think, uh, distinction to make. It's hard to imagine nowadays, but libraries were seen as um, ultimate place to really feel immersed in knowledge and expertise. Um, as you can see, the number of books were already quite numerous, but also the book was the, the most advanced way to consolidate expertise. and. Um, people were so proud on it and it was uh, really like heaven like the future of life and we can still see it that's really the main precursor of open educational resources but also we should um, be aware that the whole situation 
of what we now call learning was seen as a kind of contemplation. It was seen as a way to approach the higher world of the pure ideas, as Plato would say it. So, in that sense, schools and education have been making a huge step forward to see nowadays learning is a process that belongs to life. It's not something that you need to isolate yourself. It is a natural process in whatever you do. If it's your free time, if it's working, if it's in your home, relaxation, if it's making art, learning is an innate aspect of life. And that makes us also now more versatile to make really a pedagogical world in the schools where children feel at home, where they can play, where they can bridge to their actual states of development. Seen from the library as we just saw, this situation is called Bentham's Panopticum by Kenneth Wayne, is already many steps forward to what we call now the World Wide Web. At the time, buildings, especially prisons, were famous for um, monitoring many people. It was the ideal situation at the time to see from one perspective in the middle of a building, look around 360 degrees at all the six levels of the building, you could see who was behaving well or who was trying to do naughty things, trying to escape, for instance. So Bentham's panopticum is still the ideal of the World Wide Web that from your chair you can see the whole world. And in the technical sense it has been, it's now true, you, you can try it by yourself and you can see even more than on the TV. You have millions of channels and in that sense, it's a very early idea from the encyclopedia now to say, yes, I can see everything. From the situation of the ancient time and the Greek and the philosophers from Persia, for instance, uh, the mentality to define what is learning what is really reading text, what is uh, making your interest into thinking, into memory. This picture suggests that not so long ago, maybe 50 years ago, the newspaper, for instance, was really read in detail. And it is the first step to the development of new approaches in learning and knowledge acquisition. The step became to read through the text as if you read behind the text questions like who has been writing it? For who is the text meant? Who can understand the text? Who am I? What does the text mean to me? That is a metacognitive point of view and it is now the case that the World Wide Web, the ultimate open educational resource, is especially those last famous questions. It is the questions, what do I want from the text? What text do I need? If the texts are not appropriate, I will write my own text. I will modify existing text. The text becomes a, a living text. A living document and finally the text will be dissolved I think the text will become fluid you can speak to the text you can easily modify the text by dragging and clicking and the text is just some point some momentary point of understanding by you your interpretation becomes the text and someone else will built upon your interpretation and the text will be fluid, it will be an ongoing process of interpretations and 
let's say, future directedness. And how can we prevent teachers from getting lost in information space? Well, this is something I would know very little about, so... Very good question and a relevant question. I think it's not only for teachers, but it's, it's for anyone who is searching on the web. One of the typical things that happen is that you don't find what you're looking for, but you find something else that's even more valuable. So you lose your agenda. And for a normal consumer, if it's in your leisure time, it's good, it's entertaining. But for teachers, they might forget to teach what they are supposed to teach about. And that is a problem. How can we help them? Tools. We have conceptual representations, we have rubrics, we have search tools, we have also help groups, we have groups of teachers who help each other to find the best places on the web, etc. The plethora is growing. And find out for yourself what are at the moment already search tools on the web for you. In this diagram, which is a rather complex one, you can study maybe for five or ten minutes on it, uh, you see two dimensions. The vertical dimension goes from, on the bottom, facilitators and participants. Those are the people who have a uh, supportive role in education. Then we have individual faculty, those are the faculty members. On top of that, we have the faculty team, which is a group, typical uh, department level. And we have the instructional design team, a group of teachers who want to make a collective effort to make a, a course that they would never be able to make individually by themselves. That's the vertical dimension. It goes from incidental to large structures like faculties, universities, consortia of universities. On the horizontal dimension, we have the modalities. It starts at the left side with face-to-face, -face. that's the most natural one, if you meet someone on the marketplace or in the corridor or in the, at the coffee machine, you have the option to, to share anything that you want to say. Uh, you can say it as long as it uh, belongs to your professional domain. Face-to-face uh, -face is very flexible, it's also elicitating, it invites you to talk to someone even if you don't know the person. Then at the second place, one step to the right, is the blended hybrid. It means that um, universities nowadays, as you know, they have a mix of modalities. They can do the face-to-face, -face, they can do it in the lecture hall, they can do it by telephone or by Skype or Zoom or Teams, Microsoft Teams. That is called blended. Uh, then we have the pure online courses where there is no single in this moment, the teacher don't see the students like I am now talking to you, or even if I don't know you, it's recorded and then sent to you. So it's an asynchronous online course. Those are the two dimensions. And in the matrix in between, you see the, the green area where MOOCs uh, like Stanford University um, they have so-called recorded video lectures. They can uh, send it around, they can broadcast it. It can be accessed by students all over the world. And it's a mix of the traditional non-profit at the left side. We have the ad hoc and we have the real commercial branding to use the MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses to sell the university. It's a kind of marketing approach, you could say. It's an identity that will easily go to students to be convinced that this university is a very good one. And of course, students are not satisfied to follow the video lectures on demand. They want to be on the campus. They want to see, they want to meet the professors. They want to have a very local impression an experience. That is the meaning of this matrix diagram. Well, here you see, at the left side, you see a complex diagram. 
it deals with all the transitions, all the transactions when persons buy or sell a house in the Netherlands. I presume that even if we belong to the European Union, it will still be different among the European countries. Not to talk about countries at different continents, for instance. It's a, it's a consolidation, it's a, it's a convention, people agree about it, that the safe way to buy and sell a house is to do several steps, like going to the archives, find out is he or she really the owner of the house, secondly, what to the cadaster, what's the property of the land, what's the size and the location of the land, etc. So it's, a, it's a, let's say, it's a long process to make this scheme, it costs several hundreds of years, and finally now it's accepted as the best way to uh, avoid any conflicts later. That's a schematic representation. The goal is to convey the process of buying and selling. Nothing more, nothing less. At the right side, <coughs> you'll see we have four different ways of representation. The schematic representation that we just discussed is a procedural scheme. It means that if you follow all the steps, it gives a certain guarantee that the house will be bought in a safe way. But on the top, you see three other levels. It's the conceptual level, it's the epistemic level, and the episodic level. The conceptual level is the main ideas that have been proven by science, experience, by repeating experiments, uh, by rationalizing, by even by computation. It are the concepts that they are without any dispute, like the Newton's laws, uh, if you hesitate about gravity or velocity or acceleration, you have to go to the experts and you will find what are the hardcore concepts. So it's the objective source of our knowledge. The epistemic knowledge goes one step further. It is the framework of description. So what do experts see as the more generic knowledge, the more general knowledge, and what is the more particular knowledge that might fit in certain situations, in certain subdomains. So epistemic is, let's say, it's the descriptive discipline to order knowledge from generic to specific. The episodic way of uh, describing expertise is in what situations, in what occurrences, in what procedures was the knowledge developed. And stories are typical examples of episodic knowledge. The knowledge happened so and so. Once upon a time there was a man who lost his child and went to find out why the child was struck by a car, for instance. So that's an episodic framework. And, of course, we will talk later, in terms of representation, why we need these four levels of description. What you see here is a six-step procedure to build upon open educational resources. In this case, they mentioned it text-based, of course, text is a very um, common way to represent expertise, to write learning material. And the six steps are, from left to right, set aside time. Quite important, many people forget that collecting and searching and scouting for the right information is a time-consuming activity. Don't forget that. Don't say it's just copying information. No, it is a very personal, it's a very sophisticated process, I would say. The second from the left is look at your current text. Of course, you always start with a title, 
and with a summary, with some keywords uh, from your own teaching goal and or learning goal. And what you do, you look carefully to what you have written yesterday or a few weeks ago and you build upon that. That's quite important because as soon as you will go to text databases, open resources, they are so, uh, let's say, digressing, so you might easily lose your orientation. You might come up with a different course than what your students are waiting for. And that's the risk to keep your agenda. The third one from the left, step three, is locate an open educational resource text. So actually spotting an appropriate text that might help you to stand on the shoulders of some other experts and build your own quality based resources. That is locate it, find it, spot it and label it. Don't forget it. You have to document that as well. Step four is browse open repositories. Browsing means you have an open mind, you are curious to find even more valuable things than what you were searching for. It's also called the serendipity effect. And browsing is really risky. Uh, it's good, it's risky in two ways. You might find something much more valuable than what you saw before, but also it might be something that completely distracts your attention from what you have in mind and you might end up with a course that is not appropriate. Step five, the supplement. Look at your learning objectives and find different materials for different topics. So the supplement is the kind of optional um, phase where you try to refine and to saturate the topic entailment, so the, the branching of the topic, um, divide and conquer is a typical word for that. So we are trying to fill up all the small nitty-gritty details so that you get a complete course with a lot of details. That's called in the supplement scouting. And then step six is a very open, honest phase where you say, well, you meet many questions. You get some doubt. Uh, am I on the right track? You have to consult your colleagues. You have to go to your principal, to the person who gives you the assignment to do the courses. It might be your professor, it might be your dean, it might be your rector or provost. It's asking help. Be honest on the doubts that you have. That is the step six. And of course, in between, there are many iterations. From step five, you may branch back to step three. You may go up to step four and quit. Uh, step five immediately goes to step six. So it's not a prescriptive order. It's just a natural list of occurrences that might help you to proceed. Take it as a heuristic, not as a not as a scaffold, it's more than that, it's, it's just a procedural help for you. Here you see a nice scheme, I think it's a very elegant way to represent the procedural flow from the top to the bottom. It all starts with a person who has been so dedicated to make something, coherent information, an explanation, a novel, piece of music, a video sequence, and has fully give all the efforts, all the time, to make it nice. We call it the producer. He or she is the origin of what we call open educational resources. Once it's published and announced as being open for reuse, it becomes a delivery mechanism. So posting it in the right rubrications, so to announce it, in the right databases, that's vital to make something uh, searchable on the web. Once someone does it, he or she believes it's valuable and he or she is not shy to give it uh, to any other person, to let it reprocess, to change it, 
to build upon it. The stage, the next stage where you see the farm or the storage house with the farmer is the owner. He has some fruits, he has some, he has some delicate material taken from the web and this farmer says my fruits are ready for the market. It's open, uh, it's even free, that's the difference from the normal markets that we see it here. But the return is not only is not necessarily money, because it might be free, but the return is reputation. If a person, a producer or an owner who might be a publisher, might be a broker, uh, that person is uh, very, very much dependent on the status in the audience, in the users. So if a certain, let's say, Netflix movie is available, all the users will decide um, what they like it. If they like it, their appreciation. And you can see then that there is a whole scale of users. It can be shared, it can be remixed, it can go to an entirely new repository, repository two. It can be an exchange model where the, eventually there might be some financial transaction and it might be repurposed. So let's say a bakery course for professional bakers might be reused, might be repurposed for housewives who like to bread, to make their own bread. And that's the, uh, that's the delicate phase where we see open resources are taking place. The exchange says, it is a kind of market like bartering. You give something, in kind and you get something back and sometimes no money is involved but it's kind of a mutual service and that is the broad spectrum of reuse as you might see in open educational resources We have just said, take a break, because there are so many concerns. And now we see here, in the picture, we see a large space of possibilities. It's the teacher as an individual, it's the group of teachers, like a department, we have the faculty, we have the whole university, or even a consortium of universities. You're now talking about the model, with the course design on one X and modality yeah, on the other. Right. So vertically are the stakeholders, mm -hmm. horizontally we see the, the trend to go from face-to-face -to, -face to hybrid, to mm. blended learning. That's what, where we start. And then we ask ourselves, what kind of representation is best for teachers? Traditionally, we have conceptual, epistemic, episodic, but the procedural one is a very key one. It's a kind of, um, it's a model to say, first do this, do this, and do this, a mm. three or four step approach. And that's that approach, can be seen here in figure 50, where we say, set aside some time, look at your current text, locate the OERs, browse open repositories, look for supplementation, additional information to make it rich enough, and don't forget to ask help in time mm. from your colleagues, from some experts in the field. So that is the overall scheme. And then we go to this. Uh, I would say appetizer. It is. Um, what is that appetizer you're talking? The appetizing about? means it is. No, a, what is the, the actual thing you are talking about now? This is slide. It is slide 51. 51 correct. 51 shows a top-down approach where we have a producer. The producer can be a teacher, but then we have the resources as an output. We have the delivery mechanism. We have the question: Who is the owner? Mm. If it's a mix of co-authors. Is it really, can we say, who is the owner or is it the group? Is it a, maybe if it's fully open, it's collective property. And then we have these various functions to make it work. So we have the sharing, the remixing, the exchange, and not to forget the multi-purposing, the, the repurposing, uh, where you say we have a course meant for bakeries or for doctors, and now you say we want to make it available for housewives. How to cook your own bread, for instance. Okay. 
Okay. Um, to you the question, Susan. Uh, do you feel sympathetic to this schematic thing? Do you feel is it is it appropriate or what? Mm. What would you suggest? So you're yeah. It's it's an interesting question to ask. How can you support teachers in using these OREs best? And your argument is that a, a procedural sch schema uh, helps teachers to work with those yes. new tools. Yes. And this is of course a balance again, because schemas and schedules are useful in many cases. At the same time, you force the teacher to think, to think in linear and fixed ways. And in many cases this gives stability and gives a way for teachers to uh, guide teachers. And at the same time it limits. So this of course is also depending on the context and the perception of the teacher. Do they feel this is a useful schema to them? And in what way is it not, does it not fit their reality? Because it's an abstract idea, right? It's a, almost a summary of all the experiences someone can have and it's made in a schematic way. So when I would offer this to teachers, my first question to them would be, in what way is it applicable to your context? And in what way is it, does it miss a critical part of what your teaching is about? And then you can use it uh, in a way that fits your, your context. Marvelous point. Um, Maybe if I can try to summarize your yeah, advice is summarize. let teachers make their own schedule so that it, it helps them to articulate what's the current practice and then it might be fitting, they can comment, they get advices, but this is maybe too rigid, it's maybe too precise. It's good to have a starting point. Like yeah. you said, there's so much it can be confusing and that's why a procedure is helpful. So it's good to start with something that already exists. It gives people uh, stability. Right. And then you have to create the flexibility for them to apply it in a way that's meaningful to them. It's a kind of scaffolding, is it? You give a very strict menu what to do, mm. and then you give more and more freedom as they develop their skills and their confidence. Yeah, depending on where they are in the stage of applying exactly. those. Exactly, and it could be a long, long process, maybe more than five years or maybe more than three weeks, that's depending yeah. on their ambition as well. Yeah. And I think this is a general um, idea in helping teachers. In, in general, you can ask, where are they at? Can you provide them with something and then have them adjust it in a way that's meaningful to them? Yes. yes. We ask ourselves, should OERs, should they be multimodal? Should they contain mobile devices? Should they be ubiquitous? Should they be vicarious? Vicarious means that you learn from another person, how another person learns. Should it have any type of information? Or should we limit in the beginning from text and pictures like we have in the books? That's the main question. Susan, what's your first idea about this? So the question is, is it essential for learning to include multimodal modality in ORE, OERs? Multi multimodality means uh, offering the material in different forms, in different formats, in different ways. Um, and the question is, is that essential for learning? And this is interesting because Offering course materials in different forms means that students can uh, choose the form that aligns best with their way of processing the information. And that I think most people would agree on. This is beneficial to their learning, right? If you have multiple ways in which you can process the information, there's a higher chance that you will understand this uh, in the end. The question though is, is it essential for learning? And this is where I would push back a little against this idea. Is it really essential? Because of course it's a, it's a luxury, it's good to have different forms, but I'm not sure that if it's per se essential. Um, there are many situations where, there's, where there is not the possibility to include many 
different forms uh, of of information, and then you do with with what you have. So, uh, I think the essential part for learning, the essence in learning, is the interaction between the teacher and the student, and the modality can help with that. Great. Yeah. What a nice critical stand. Uh, that is really yeah. uh, what I have not thought about. So it is really what each of us have to think. If you prepare for your students, ask yourself, are they uh, verbal, are they auditive, are they inactive students? Depends from the developmental stage of the students as well. Eh? If you mm. think about Piagetian progress from the concrete to the abstract, where are they? Are they gifted in speech, whatever? A question of this blog that uh, is, is from me, and because I always feel it's important to acknowledge the posi possible negative effects that an educational intervention or practice can have. So this question is, apart from all the positives that we thought about, positive secondary effects, what could be negative secondary effects resulting from using these um, open educational resources? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Good question, Susan. Um, as you ask it now, I think what we call the strong points of OERs, sharing content, knowledge different, different knowledge, is a driver for innovation. That essentially can be good, but there's a danger. The danger I would see is that it drags the attention away from the teacher. The teacher might be distracted, might come to cosmetic elements in his or her education, and that's a negative effect. I think here we have a really positive effect, but maybe you can you can mention some kind of neg negative mm. potential. Okay. It says, open educational resources provide a learner center platform that authentically marries technology with education and provides access and equity to education resources for all. Yes, and I and think this is a secondary effect to really pay some attention to because Quality of education is not only about what it means for one student, it's about what it means to a group of students and can it benefit all students that you try to educate. Although it seems that open educational resources are benefiting access and equity, there are multiple ways in which it can also temper equity or stand in the way from equal education. And one of the ways that I can think of right now is that if you focus on open educational resources and the technology involved and you focus on that as being a benefit, communities that don't have access to these type of resources may feel left behind and may not benefit from the learning potential that these resources have. For example, there are countries where the infrastructure is not as uh, developed, um, which may limit the use of such resources. And we don't want to go to a place where not having open educational resources is associated with lower quality. Because that is not always the case. So we cannot automatically connect these ideas of open educational resources with educational quality, because thereby you can, um, you can limit the potential of environments that don't have access to those tools yet. And so I, I can imagine in that sense it may create more inequality and it's May not, but it's always good to keep your eyes out of for in what way is it uh, maybe disadvantaging some uh, communities. Wow, Susan. I've never thought about this aspect. The luring danger that high tech may enlarge the gap between types of countries, developing yeah. and the Western countries yeah. and infrastructure. So that's a risk at global at the global scale that parts of the world are left behind and get more and more distance. Lovely point. Educational open resources are so numerous and so extensive in various databases and along the web institutions have their own repositories. 
uh, that it has the risk of uh, getting lost and the risk of cognitive overload. That's why in this uh, section we will try to cover uh, that type of risk. What is the, exactly the risk? Uh, what can we do? What are typical tools? What are methods for representation in order to, uh, to reduce the cognitive overload? One way to reduce an overload of information is a creative one, as you can see on the postcard. Uh, if you have been visiting Sofia, you might send such card to your family and show how exuberant the city is, how many nice monuments can still be found. And uh, Alexander Nevsky Cathedral, for instance, and you have all the squares all the statues. Um, what's happening here? Everything on the card is correct. It, you can find it. How, however, the constellation is totally a lie. You cannot find it in one glance in Sofia. It is so-called montage. Uh, very clever. You only have to buy one postcard to see the whole city, but it's not really the reality. And that's what we do um, in curricula. We make so we inter introduce so many topics, and we have a struggle to cover the full extension of the courses. And uh, that's one typical situation. That's also, of course, it even gets worse if we use the open educational resources because we get more and more aspects of information. And the only way to escape from overload is to make a compilation that is fair due to the relevance of the topics and is also digestible. So not um, so complex like this postcard, but more lucid representation so that the student has the feeling he or she can see everything at the topic level. Another way to cope with information overload is to make a meaningful graphic understanding. In this case, the topic is how Napoleon went into Russia. And uh, that's the, the yellow line. It's broad. It's, of course, it's uh, euphemistic. Napoleon thought, thought he would reach Moscow in several weeks and then would con conquer Russia and uh, would have the glory there. Uh, of course, we know the story. Um, the retreat uh, was very painful because the supply routes were not uh, accessible. It was much longer. So the, the soldiers started from, to starve from, uh, from hunger. And uh, Napoleon only saw very few soldiers coming back to Paris. It was really a disaster. This uh, schematic representation allows you to see the, the size of the groups as they went in. It's a broad army. If it comes back, it becomes even smaller and smaller, more tiny. You see many curves in the road because they had to improvise to go over the rivers and it was a very painful thing. So it's one glance, you could say rhetoric, on what was the, the terrible thing of Napoleon trying to conquer Russia. You could see this as a nice device for teachers to explain and uh, to, to, to illustrate to students at that level. The safety rod is a good example. It's a precursor to what we later call concept maps or mind maps. The essence is that before you actually go into the information, like the Bible or the Talmud, uh, you have to activate your prior knowledge. Uh, imagine the constellation of the dependencies. What are the, 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 the main relations between the concepts? Uh, visualize it and then from that representation allow new information to come in. That's what we call 
metacognitive support. A good example of schematic representations are the underground maps. Here you see the New York underground map and you might be surprised uh, about the history and the uh, non-trivial transformations that, uh, especially in the case of the London underground map, were necessary to create such schematic diagrams. Because it's not a map, it has some isomorphy to the physical map, but it's completely dominated by the question how can we travel in the most comfortable way from A to B? Which line we should bring as far as possible without transitions? And um, so that that's, is a technical and it's a conceptual finding how to do that. Here you see an even more symbolic format of the New York underground. Um, the lines have been straightened in contrast to the previous diagram. They are long lines and you can see in the left lower corner the lines are very much compressed as it's the center of the city and uh, it, is, uh, it, it needs less details for the passengers. Uh, there is more space for the uh, for the middle part of the city um, and uh, the main goal was to keep all the names of the stations readable from this map it's a huge work and it needs a lot of let's say ergonomic and visual understanding to to make it and even to use it This London underground map is maybe even more familiar to you. It is uh, famous for because it was the cradle to develop the notion of schematic diagram on top of, um, of a topology. Uh, you can see here that the River Thames, it is still a shape which is rather similar to the real shape. But, of course, the main goal was to just to indicate that certain stations land at the South Bank and some land at the North Bank, which is important to know if you don't want to find another bridge. Uh, the main goal, again, is to, to find the most easy way and to avoid transitions. Uh, this map is the outcome of a long process, which I'm going to show you in the next slides. Without explaining, you can see that there is a natural evolution from the topology, which was a correct literal representation of the spaces and the distances in the city of London, but it was unreadable as an underground uh, travel scheme. scheme. Uh, and in this case, um, it was becoming clear in the 30s that uh, they need a totally new approach, not the physical map but schematic diagram.
What is the price of reducing cognitive overload in OERs? Hmm, we've just seen that on a map, a transport map, there is a use for reducing the cognitive overload. Um, but how does that work in OER specifically, Pete? Yeah, well, I think it's inevitable that we need some navigation. A navigation like the signpost on the road, it shows you where can I find Amsterdam or Utrecht and that prunes away all the smaller cities in between. Mm. So by leaving the highway you might have a much richer travel, a bit more complicated, maybe even more dangerous. So there's a trade-off, I think, between easy going and completeness or reality the richness of the real things we show the highlights and that has a price mm. we have to be aware of that so you are saying that one of the prices that you pay for reducing cognitive overload is the uh, deviation from reality that you create the, the thing that you present is more abstract and therefore does not represent reality as good as a complex image uh, so it is a misrepresentation yes. sometimes for yes. the good of yes. reducing cognitive overload. And I think another price that you pay is that students uh, may get used to a map that is easy and simple and easy to understand. Uh -huh. uh, and could it be that by putting too much effort in reducing cognitive overload as teachers, you, uh, you miss the opportunity to educate students how to navigate a complex situation, a situation where there is a lot of information, because that is the world we live in, right? You Google your question and you get 20 results and you have to then decide what source do I trust and how do I interpret what I read. And this is also something that I think we should address in education. And by redu constantly reducing the cognitive overload, you may run into that danger of uh, yeah, not preparing students for a real-life complex environment. Simplify as, it, uh, as its price, is that right? Yeah. So there's a saying, we have a saying, we have small lies, big lies and statistics. statistics. It says that by squeezing your information in diagrams, you may suggest that this is the reality, but in fact it's uh, it's a severe reduction. Is that fair? Does it make sense? Do you no. agree? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Up to you to think further. Susan, the reason that I now introduce something like cognitive science is that we have found students very, very much to the degree of short-term memory capacity, complex name, but means some people are able to reproduce the last few seconds or minutes and some completely forgot about what they do to survive, to make all the links, they make the elaborations to integrate what they just heard in their long term, in a meaningful memory. Interesting. Do you believe in this cognitive style dimension? Is it, is, uh, is it plausible? Well, I assume that you read a lot of studies that indicate this, so it's not, mm -hmm. I hope it's not so much about believing but okay. trusting the research. Yeah, yes. okay. But what you are saying is it's, uh, you presented a model, right? An abstract idea of you have holistic thinkers and... Serial. 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 Serialistic, yeah. yeah. And it, this model almost assumes that there's a dichotomy between holistic and serial. And I think in reality, as people, we are somewhere on that spectrum. And maybe in some ways we are holistic and maybe in some ways we are serial. That's a sophisticated point of view. I fully agree that maybe it's not an overwhelming one style topology, but people have mixed and maybe in one domain you are holistic, in the other domain you are serious. Yeah. That is, 
is likely. Yeah. We need more research on that. But the model of differentiating between different styles, the simplified version, is useful to, uh, for teachers, I think, also, to be aware of the differences that people can have in processing information. Fully agree. So, yeah. The most traditional one is the dichotomy between verbalizers and visualizers. Mm. And what we find out that it's tricky because students may develop from verbalizers to visualizers or vice versa. Thanks a lot, yeah. Susan, for thought provoking ideas. To be continued. The question we have been posing is are these approaches for educational innovation are they useful for all students? Actually, I came up with this question because it's a, uh, an honest concern that I have when I think of all this technology and open resources that we bring into the classroom. Um, because for me as a student, I feel very distracted by all of this. And I can imagine that for some students in the classroom this might work the same. That when they have too much information coming at them and too much different formats and different impulses, that they get overwhelmed easily or that they get distracted easily. So I think this question is very relevant to ask, is if you bring in a new technology into the classroom, for whom is it working? Probably for some students it is, but what students are left behind and are not benefiting from this technology uh, as much as we would like to? Uh, and then being flexible in uh, knowing when to uh, offer such resources to students and when to leave them and have students focus on uh, a traditional textbook. Or, and it also depends, of course, on the context. Any additional thoughts? Thanks, Susan, for your thoughtful <laughs> ideas. I was also thinking maybe the innovations are just exciting for the teachers, but not proven yet for the benefit of the students. So That's that is a, a question for each of you, especially you becoming educational leaders. So the question that is asked here, how to promote creativity in OER design? And it's interesting because we, we've talked a lot so far about how to simplify, how to create procedures, um, and now all of a sudden it's about creativity. How do you make sure that even though the tools are readily available online and teachers can just use it, that there is this a sense of creativity in using it and that teachers use it in a way that is uh, that fits their um, their way of teaching and their and that new ideas are added to the the existing tool. Any thoughts, Pete? Sorry. Any thoughts? Yeah, uh, you say it perfectly. I think uh, by by grabbing resources, by picking and mixing. Uh, does it squeeze away the creativity? Are, you too, are we too much obsessed by reusing and forgetting what's our own idea? That's maybe the risk. Mm. So it might be what we call template effects. It becomes like uh, too much caricatures once created by some smart people and teachers tend to copy it without giving it the extra flavor they should give for their local students. Mm. So that's a risk. And it is to uh, each of you to think about it. What do you value? The comfort or the, let's say, analyze and paralyze? That's maybe. Your own comfort so. or the analyze and para para analyze and? Uh, paralysis by analysis. 
too Can much. Can you explain what that means? Uh, if you sing too much from scratch, you might get tired and you might get very stiff, paralyzed. So finally you surrender and say, I don't know it anymore. Right, so you don't want to analyze too much that you get stiff and empty. And you don't want to be too much comfortable by just taking whatever is there without analyzing it yourself. So you're saying it's somewhere in between. Thanks, Susan. I couldn't say it better. The question is, where is that between for you? Yeah, in this section we hope to ask the questions why are so many teachers hesitant about adopting OERs? And that's, that's a good thing, we, have to, we need to know that. Uh, we see here that only maybe 7% says yes, but the majority is still hesitant. They are cautious, they are nervous to do it. Now, Susan. Can you give some other perspective how we should look to these uh, contradictions or these constraints? Mm. Yeah, some perspective also to the question how do we approach the skepticism that is among teachers? And it's and no wonder that they are skep skeptic that skepticism. There's skep skepticism. Yeah. That's a word. Poof. Um, because teachers are incredibly busy and they have already enough on their plates. And then another thing that they have to do is not something that they are eager to learn about. So, uh, in my opinion, the only way to make an educational resource useful is to make it useful for the teacher. And teachers do have issues that they run into. For example, they don't have enough time to spend on the students. How can uh, open educational resources uh, save time for teachers so they can have more, they can shift their attention to other things that they want to pay attention to. If an open educational resource can address a problem that a teacher has or uh, an issue that they're having in their teaching or uh, then it can be a useful tool. So I think instead of looking only at the benefits for learning, we should also look at how it can address uh, a problem that the teacher has and how can it benefit or how can it allow the teacher to be doing their jobs better and more relaxed and more free, freely. Thanks Susan, it's a very constructive uh, view for our vision um, and I think that's good to give that as a takeaway. Hmm. Well, Susan, we come after a long trip to the main question. In reality, mobile learning is the default way of accessing courses. How can OERs help mobile learning to become more effective? What's your feeling after all this expedition? And by mobile learning, beat me or we mean the learning that you do through your mobile phone or Smart. mobile device. Smart. Smart telephone. Smartphone. Smartphone. iPad. Maybe smart. or no? Smart iPad. <laughs> Only smart, <laughs> smart ones. Um, yeah, because we came to the conclusion that OERs, it's not a question of do we want this, yes or no? Is this going to be the future, yes or no? It's going to be a big part of, of education and preparing the next generation to 
flourish in their lives. There's no way to avoid this. The real question then is how do we use it in a way that's beneficial um, and that's useful also on mobile devices. Wow. And that, what does it mean for teachers? They still get these young children in the classroom with all these devices. So the blend of when they say, go to your phone, find out some topics, do some study and come back and report for the whole group. That's maybe the art of teaching in the future. Mm. Do you agree or am I too, too futuristic? Yeah, I think there are many arts to teaching, but one of the dealing with technology is definitely one of those things. Not only how do you use technology and how do you, uh, how do you use it in, in learning and teaching, but also how do you remove, get, uh, yeah, turn them off or move away from that. Because not, teaching is not only on their mobile device. Uh, I guess there should be a time where students share among each other, where they don't look at the screen, but they look at their neighbor. Uh, which can be a challenge, a shift between the, uh, the different So forms. the art of switching off the devices at the right moment, is that true? Yeah, maybe. The, the human... Who knows the future? Maybe interaction. Maybe in a couple yeah. of years we only know how to interact yes. through uh, devices. Well, partly is wait for it, solutions will be made in education. Partly we, have to, uh, we need the courage to step forward and to make exemplars to see where, how far we can go. Yeah. That the courage to do that. Yeah, and the curiosity and reflection to see is it working, in what way is it or is it not. On that note, you've known me through your mobile devices, through your computers, and I have to, uh, well, this is the end for me, but it was a real pleasure to share this experience with you and uh, to get some of the expertise from this. Uh, from Professor Commerce and, and maybe meet you in the future. Thank you so much, Susan. Through your presence and contribution here, the meeting has become so much more vivid and uh, I think effective. The conversation, the dialogue has been excellent. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. The question is, why are open educational resources so important? That's what we discuss now. I mentioned them, it's an economical reason, it might be logistic in terms of flexibility, production factors, didactic versatility, exploitation like earning money, the business model could be different, and the policy like it's fitting now to the need of Corona proof. Mm. What do you think, Susan? Is this a relevant I think there is a very important element missing. What about the quality of education? The quality of instruction? Exactly. I have thought in point four, didactic, to adapt and differentiate mm. the flexibility for the didactic reasons. But you might see a broader topic. Mm. In terms I see of broader topics which are quality of the education, instruction, mm -hmm. uh, accessibility, I think is a very important key element of yes, why yes. Uh, open educational resources are of added value, why it adds something on top of the traditional uh, instruction. Okay, excellent example, uh, excellent remark. Uh, we take it in mind and I will add it to the course. So students will see part of your suggestion, right? right? Yes. Is it fair? Uh, let's go and um, talk about what are educational resources? Uh, have you some experiences with open education? Uh, I mean, with the open access resources, etc. Did you use it that? I use a lot of YouTube videos to learn about different analysis strategies, um, how to use certain analysis programs. There's a lot of information online, so I, I guess I use them, but I never thought of them as a particular thing. It was integrated in your all over job. You it's integrated in my life. Yeah. When there's something unknown, I Google. I Google what's there and I get oh, YouTube okay. videos. So for you it's already a habit. It's not uh, essentially new thinking. Uh, have you seen colleagues who had problems to use the open educational resources when they prepare a course? Mm. Well, I guess it's a, a different mindset, right? That we are used 
to information being in specific places and being fixed and it's in books and you but these days information is everywhere and it's not so much about getting the information itself but it's about skills how to find the correct information that you know is valid and how to use certain certain search terms that get you to the right place where the information is exactly the information that you need well that's an inspirational view isn't it it is already endemic in our way of living. Um, thank you for that, Susan. Uh, here is some picture on uh, slide 18. Type of educational resources. We see the images, videos, etc. And uh, we have even audio podcasts, tests and quizzes, elements of existing courses, slides and class presentations. Is it helping teachers if they get the repertoire and just include it, will it, will it improve or will it hamper their teaching? Well, both. It can do both, depending can, on yeah. how it's used. Wow. How to, how to stimulate the right use? Do we need courses for that? Courses like this? To inform them and to warn them for negative side effects? Or how would you see the, the best way to increase the benefits well it depends right it's such a broad broad type of resources these things i can imagine all different ways of applying this to your teaching mm -hmm. and i can imagine all different contexts in which a use of an open educational resource might be beneficial or might not be beneficial yeah. to give an example i can imagine a classroom where you feel students should in their homework use open educational resources but what if your classroom if half of the students in your class don't have access to good internet and you send them home with the idea that they are going to explore online uh, and half of the class isn't able to access those things though I think there's a lot that you should take into consideration when you use such resources in your teaching it's true, I think so and even teachers might not have access in certain places of the world it might be very difficult so that's, uh, that's a no-go if this is the case, the not being online, open education resources are not the right, right thing to go for. Well, I think that many of the students, as they have seen so far our introduction, they might ask, wow, why education resources? We have MOOCs now, we have complete courses online, massive open online courses. Even MOOC.org is an example. Uh, might it overtake? Because in this case, the teacher is stepping back and opens the door to a complete course remotely from mm. another university. That's a kind of trade-off, eh? the balance between molding, assembling your own course based on resources, or giving full access to an excellent course at Harvard. How do you see that balance? Do you have some intuition why we have to think on one side or go back to the other side? So this is an interesting story that I heard once, is that the moment these online MOOCs, the online open courses uh, started, I think this was early 2000 maybe, yeah. it's quite some time ago, yeah. educational scientists or people in higher education at least were freaked out because they thought if this is the the future what do we do as universities as educational institutions they were scared that they wouldn't survive that in a couple of years they will be redundant exactly. but this didn't happen because MOOCs are not as effective and engaging as people thought they would be apparently for human beings it's really hard to get the full satisfaction and learning experience from a MOOC uh, than it is to have a real real-time interaction and I think we all recognize this in Corona that the online version uh, definitely doesn't meet the the real-time experience yet it might be that it is that it will in the future when you think about all new ways in which we can have this interaction but this started a whole new movement at least in educational resources is a re research is to look into can we find a hybrid form where you have both the 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 benefits of real life real time educational instruction yeah. and the online components 
And there is, in my opinion, where they benefit and where you get the advantage of an open online resource. It's not the open online resource in itself that results in learning. It's the addition to a uh, to a traditional form. So the hybrid form is where you get a uh, the benef- wow. benefits of this. What a nice point that we meet. Um, that was also what I was thinking before assembling the course. I, I did not find your... an answer. I did not find <laughs> an answer. But Susan gives exactly where we have to look. It's the blended education, right? It's a mix of the face-to-face and the web-based access. Mm. Where students do it in their own time. Well, um, we can talk about the balance between how to make ideal blend, but that's also a very personal thing, I think, and uh, teaching might get used and might maybe shift, finally, to the online version. The IV4J project uh, deals with vocational education and training. Uh, Important part is the entrepreneurial mindset for young people during their learning of regular education and also uh, during the phase of vocational training, of course. And uh, one other important ingredient is the request for open educational resources. So if you are curious about this project, please go through the slides and uh, you can even uh, contact persons like uh, Dr. Peppino Franco or me to ask more for it. And you will find on the website, you find the full exemplar of reports and lessons from this project. Open educational resources are a very strong example of what we call the transition from long life learning, which was the historical basis for education and training, to lifelong learning. Uh, Educational resources uh, are a constant fuel to innovate the content and the method of our teaching. And uh, for teachers it means lifelong learning, lifelong gaining new competences. And that's why we uh, encourage you to explore the picture besides that uh, is completely obsolete now. Try to imagine the future where teachers will be lifelong learners. This triangle, learning, playing, working, will be an ongoing theme through the course on educational resources and in gamification as well. And uh, the most intriguing link uh, you can imagine is the link between playing and working. Normally we are reluctant to think about it but uh, I hope it will be clear after the gamification section that it is the most vital element for Western societies. The takeaway of this part of my lectures on open education resources is that the continuous drive to keep learning to keep open to unforeseen new trends is 
after learning, namely the willingness to change yourself. And especially after the gaming section, I hope it will become clear that this is the vital message, the meta message, so to say, of my contribution to this course. We have now come into the section of test questions on open and educational resources. The questions are not meant to measure your actual knowledge at this moment. It's more meant to orient yourself um, between what I think is important to have a mind, to reason, and uh, what you can actually do. Uh, if you find a question which is uh, completely sounds like um, like Chinese language to you, um, I would say go back to that section, uh, go through the dialogues, and uh, then come back to this question, try to make it. I hope you will uh, take it seriously because questions are not to measure, the questions are mainly to orient, we call it formative evaluation is to orient the student to his or her own, his or her actual state of the learning. I wish you success with it. If One of the famous MOOC organizations is edX.org. It's a leader in online courses. Uh, whether you are interested in learning or for yourself or leveraging online courses to educate your workforce or creating a MOOC, edX can help. If you go to MOOC.org, you will see it contains more than 2,000 online courses. 
the definition of MOOC is Massive Open Online Course, uh, which is freely online available for anyone to enroll. And enroll means that you feel yourself in the role of student and you will be evaluated, you will be coached uh, in different ways, but anyway, you are visiting as a student, as a learner. MOOCs provide an affordable and flexible way to learn new skills, advance your career and deliver quality educational experiences at scale. Millions of people around the world use MOOCs to learn for a variety of reasons, including career development, changing careers, college preparations, supplemental learning, lifelong learning, corporate e-learning and training and more. MOOCs have dramatically changed the way the world learns. Ready to get started, go to 2,900 online courses of edX. Feel welcome to open the link and experience ultimate way of open online courses in terms of MOOC at edX.org.